I am thrilled to have Joseph Ogiman with us today. So Joseph is an exploration geologist based in Adelaide, whose life changed forever as a nine-year-old when breaking open a rock in the Flinders Ranges when he found a fossil. He hasn't stopped breaking open rocks in the many years since, working or studying on four continents. So Joseph was involved in exploring Basang in the late 1980s, which now lives on in infamy with the corporate fraud of Brex minerals at an unimaginable scale. So this is going to be an eye-opening hearing about Joseph's involvement and experiences of being tarred with the brush of missing the greatest gold discovery ever. So strap yourselves in. This is going to be quite the session. And please keep using the chat. We'll open up the floor at the end. And yes, thanks so much, Joseph, for joining. It's amazing having you. Okay. Um, thanks, Jessica. Um, first, I'll say, well, thanks for the opportunity to present this talk. It's actually something I've wanted to do for <clears throat> nearly a quarter of a century because at the time the Briex scam unraveled, uh, the consulting firm I worked for did not want any connection with the name Briex. So um, we were not involved in any way, but as you know, it's often guilt by association. So uh, I was told to say nothing. And as a result, there's a part of the Busang story, which is probably not as well known as, as others. So uh, today my talk's gonna be in two parts. It's my involvement in the late 1980s with um, the discovery and the exploration of Busang pre Briex and what it was like in the, the Wild West, which is how I could describe Indonesian exploration during the Busan boom times of the mid 1990s. Um, there are some historic maps and photos from the pre brex time, which will probably be seen here for the very first time. So hopefully you'll stay around. Uh, yeah, the, as I was saying, the Busan story is generally told through the lens of Briex, the uh, Canadian junior company who undertook the world's largest mining scam whose activities have been described in many books, in countless media articles, and even a Hollywood film, as you said, starring Matthew McConaughey. Uh, what's much less known is how the prospect was actually discovered and tested by two geologists from Adelaide in Australia, five years prior to Briex's involvement. I hope I don't disappoint by saying I will not give a forensic analysis of uh, Briex's activities, but I will talk about the discovery of Busang and then give an outline of Briex, what they did, as well as talking about the atmosphere, uh, what it was like in Indonesia during the uh, the Busang boom, when I uh, returned to Indonesia uh, only to be ridiculed for missing the world's greatest gold discovery. It was not a good time. So I think it's always nice to, uh, to start off a talk with uh, a quote. So I think this one's quite appropriate. Um, if you look at the date, this is over 100 140 years ago, uh, someone uh, realize that uh, gold mines can be uh, traps for um, players who are trying to buy shares. Uh, you can imagine if you read that, you can see that that's actually very appropriate to uh, to shareholders of Briex uh, more than 100 years after it was said. So, OK, let's begin. <clears throat> I, I realize it's, it's over a quarter of a century since uh, Briex disappeared, but uh, I found out firsthand that there's a generation of people who have, uh, know very little about it or have even heard about it. So just to clarify to those who haven't heard, Busang is the name of a very interesting gold prospect discovered in 1988 on Borneo, Indonesia, and Briex is the name of a Canadian junior company who ruined this perfectly good uh, prospect by reporting six years later that they had discovered the world's greatest gold deposit, a scam that somehow was perpetuated for three years before being exposed. It's not just a good story, but it's probably the most significant event in history to affect the exploration industry the consequences of which in the present day directly affect the way companies operate and report worldwide, leading to implementation of reporting standards I'm sure we're all familiar with, like JORC and SAMREC. And, um, even uh, Indonesia now has its own reporting uh, code. Um, now, unfortunately, I've given this story a couple of times in the last, uh, so far this year, but uh, um, Jessica has told me to prune the talk, so unfortunately some of the more colourful stories uh, will be missing, but uh, that's okay. So let's begin. So for those who don't know, Indonesia is this uh, group of 14,000 islands lying along what's known as the Ring of Fire. Indonesia, for those who don't know, from east to west is actually wider than Australia or the United States. It's a surprisingly large country. Um, <clears throat> and it lies along the confluence of three tectonic plates, the Eurasian, Pacific, and the Indo-Australian, on a regional scale. On a closer scale, if you have a look, uh, it's more complex, 
as things often are, there's a lot of micro plates and zones of subduction and um, um, oblique stress where plates meet. So it, it creates quite a complex tectonic setting. Um, why Indonesia? Why would companies want to go there? Well, this complex tectonic setting has resulted in the formation of five magmatic arcs, three of which still have active volcanism, two are dormant, the one in um, Irian Jaya and in um, on the island of New Guinea, um, has resulted in many um, mineral deposits, uh, including some world-class giants, uh, Grassberg, I'm sure people have actually heard of. Uh, there's also Onto, uh, a recent discovery, uh, and Tujubukit, if you want something to do. Um, Google Tujubukit uh, being explored by Mordeka Copper at the moment. Actually, mining has started, and one day they might find the bottom of it. Uh, uh, they keep reporting multi-hundred-metre intersections. It's a fantastic deposit. Um, so it's basically elephant country, which is why a lot of explorers have been there over the years. Why Borneo? Um, uh, Borneo is a collection of uh, complex collection of Paleozoic and Mediozoic terrains, which... Uh, in the tertiary period, uh, subduction from the northwest to the uh, from the northeast to the southwest, uh, northwest to southwest, uh, get it right, um, created a zone of partial melting, uh, which created a magmatic arc, fifteen hundred uh, or fifteen hundred kilometers long, and hosts uh, quite a large amount of uh, gold deposits uh, along it. Uh, historically, uh, several hundred years ago, people started mining um, alluvials in the west and the north. So it's been known for a long time. It's not just the fact that uh, it has got gold deposits on it. There's a range of interesting gold deposits. Uh, from the west, you get carbonate replacements at Buduk and Bao, has some Carlin type uh, features. And then towards the centre, there are more of the classic uh, low sulfidation, uh, epithermal vein and Brezia hosted uh, gold mines. And then uh, in the middle is a uh, Kalian, which is the largest gold deposit ever found there. And that fits in with the Corbett and Leach classification of a uh, carbonate base metal epithermal type uh, mineralization. It's an amazing deposit. I had the lucky to get the fortunate to have the chance to look at it when I was uh, working there in the 1980s. And um, a bit further to the north is, is Busang, where we were. And uh, you can see why we were quite excited because it lies along the same trend. It's only 100 kilometers away, which for a junior explorer is, is very close, as we always like to point out, and uh, the same style of mineralization. If you go even further north, uh, you're getting a uh, high sulfidation uh, deposit up at Suryang, which was mined within the last 10 years. And at the very north, you're getting um, porphyry copper type things. So it's a very prospective terrain. And Busang was along it. So you can see why we were interested in it. So who was the company that uh, first uh, went there? A company called uh, West Australian Resources. They floated in 87. Uh, their main asset was an uh, uh, interest in Indonesian prospects, both on the island of Borneo. <clears throat> CEO, the younger man there, is uh, Peter Beckwith. The exploration manager was uh, Graham Chuck, who was based in Perth. And uh, exploration was managed, managed by an Adelaide-based company, Murray Rogers and Associates, which consisted um, of the, the, the exploration team, consisted of John Livings and myself. Um, so why did we go there? Well, in the, um, the gold prospectivity of Indonesia, uh, the association with these uh, tertiary age intrusives was really quite well known at, uh, at that stage. And so entrepreneurs in Indonesia were picking up any ground that had uh, these sorts of intrusives in them. So <clears throat> there was a local uh, Indonesian company uh, owned by Haji Siakarani, who picked up uh, quite a few little tenements, little blocks here that all had um, intrusives. I'll colour it up a little bit to make it easier for you to see. And uh, he got a um, Indonesian geologist there to make a really quick, uh, quick evaluation. And this geologist... Uh, marked out a lot of these in purple uh, are these in uh, tertiary age intrusives andesites and diorites and he noted already at that stage that there were um, gold workings from artisanal gold miners there and this is probably the first known map to record uh, gold working associated with uh, uh, igneous rocks in Busan Creek so it's quite a historic map this is where it all started I guess you could say in the, in the 1980s so where are, <clears throat> okay, 
where are we going? Borneo is the world's third largest island, three different countries, Malaysia up to the north, a little little Brunei, oil rich Brunei. And the majority of it though is Indonesian and it's um, called Kalimantan, divided up into various states. Uh, it's, uh, it was formerly, formerly a densely jungle covered terrain and the best access was along the large network of river systems. Um, it's now the, the jungle cover is much less now with the advent of coal mining and palm oil plantations, which has, yeah, removed a lot of the beautiful jungle that was there when I was there. But uh, from early days, the main way of actually assessing uh, the interior of Borneo was by river. There's very few roads at that stage when I first went there. They're more so now, but at that stage, uh, all traffic was virtually on the rivers, including to um, Busang. So we came up... Um, Two of the towns we need to consider are Samarinda and Balikpapan, and that's where journeys always started. And um, yeah, look, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, uh, a bit of a little bit of colour of how we travelled to get to our prospect, where we'd fly to Balikpapan from uh, Jakarta because that's where the regional office was, and um, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, all exploration geologists would understand the humour of staying at a, a place called the Blue Sky Hotel, because we always talk about blue sky potential. So uh, keep keep your eyes keep your ears open for the towards the end of the talk. I'll mention Blue Sky again, the um, the concept, not necessarily the hotel. Drive up to Samarinda where we um, jumped on our uh, river boat, which was a graceful old diesel powered um, vessel, absolutely wonderful, and would slowly putter up up the river to um, as far as it could go before nightfall because no one wanted to travel after night for fear of sunken logs. And then the next morning we start again get as far as we could before the river actually became too shallow which depended on the season where we then transfer to um, one of the unique uh, borneo boats called katintins with uh, a long propeller shaft which allowed it to travel in shallow waters but also through rapids uh, that's john having a bit of a snooze up uh, on the boat there we then take that to a little village called mikabaru which was the local village to uh, our, our prospect mainly consisting of indigenous uh, diet people and uh, the last uh, five kilometers we had to walk to our base camp which was uh, hacked out of the jungle at that stage <clears throat> at the time it was all um quite exotic and remote to me and i used to love talking about traveling in borneo uh, and um unfortunately uh, well not unfortunately or unfortunately times have changed and borneo is becoming much more developed so much so that uh Indonesia recently chose to move their capital from Jakarta to a place they called Nusantara, which as you can see there is just uh, north of Balikpapan. And uh, road, uh, earthworks have started and that's where they plan to move the capital. And whether that happens, we'll have to see. And so the whole boat trip took about uh, two days. Uh, helicopters were available, but just not in the budget. Um, so why did it take so long? Well, that gives you a quick idea. 27K in a straight line versus 70 long kilometers along the river. So, And it was diesel powered. It was a lovely boat. And uh, it just gave time for contemplation, for reading, for report writing. Uh, and in John's case, uh, for a bit of guitar playing, which is always pleasant. And uh, in both of our cases, we always also enjoyed a, a chilled Clare Valley Riesling, which I would buy up, bring up from South Australia. And uh, we'd often get freshly caught river prawns from the fishermen who'd come up to the boat. So it was a very pleasant way to travel. So back to our uh, intrusive close-up of that map I showed you earlier. Uh, we were always interested to try to uh, find uh, this gold that was apparently shedding off uh, the tertiary age uh, diorite. So the first trip there was done by a couple of, uh, by the exploration manager, Graham Chuck and also by John Levings. And they noted that uh, they could they observed uh, altered diorites and um, bretzias. And uh, of course, they saw that there were comparisons with the geologic setting of the uh, Kalian deposit, which was just down, down, uh, down river, down stro uh, um, structure by 100 kilometers. But uh, as a junior, you're always looking to see if you have similarities with any major mine nearby. And, uh, we tried to make sure that we certainly found those similarities. Uh, this photo shows a group of uh, the uh, local artisanal miners who, with a wooden gold pan, they just carved out of one of the trees. So back to our little um, map, uh, looking at uh, 
the first sort of field trip for reconnaissance program that was basically mapping to see what this diorite was like and uh, what we could see nearby. The first thing we discovered was uh, that the diorite as shown in the original map was actually nowhere where it was in real life. Uh, this was not an uncommon occurrence because maps in Indonesia at the time were very poor uh, and we were not really allowed to have accurate maps for security reasons according to the army so um, you often took your chances when um, when you're picking up ground there so uh, so we found that uh, okay the diorite was not where we ex the, the the intrusion was not where we expected and it was also much larger than uh, we had thought and only less than a quarter of it was actually within our tenement so you'd think that um this was would be maybe a bit disappointing but it turns out that uh, i made a few sort of trips through here and all i could see was weak pro-politic alteration and uh, there were no uh, artisanal miners there so we thought okay most of the uh, interesting stuff was uh, up to the northwest where we thought that's where we should focus anyway so it uh, we weren't that upset in the end and i think that was justified so uh, uh first a bit of uh, work we did we did some soil sampling and some rock sampling we came up with quite a significant anomaly along Busan Creek. Uh, this became, we, we just called it the Busan anomaly and uh, Brex called it the central zone. So they just used our anomaly and gave it their own name. And as I said, I made some forays into the southeast here where all these is my um, rock sampling, uh, the little, the little um, purple triangles. <clears throat> and um, this, became known as Brex as the southeast zone which this this is the site that contained the majority of the alleged world's greatest gold deposit so I had had a look at what it looked at the surface and found nothing interesting so that's why we were not upset not to have that in our tenement uh, and this is a bit of a close-up of what we did find in what Brex called the central I, I'll use the Brex term just to avoid confusion so um, central zone, uh, we could see that there actually, this was our rock chip sampling, and there was some really nice um, samples there. You can see there was 50, nearly 60 grams, 26, 23. So th there's definitely some very interesting gold values that we found at Busan at the start. And I'll focus on one sample there that went 20 grams, <clears throat> 27 grams, sorry, uh, near the boundary, um, because this is, the, I still have this sample. It's the only surviving sample from Busan that I have in my collection, which is oh, a bit disappointing, but it's a beautiful sample. As you can see, it's an uh, outcrop. This was collected an outcrop. Uh, it's an epithermal silica sulfide vein, which in close up, you can see beautiful textures of pyrite fractured and um, lovely crystals of stibnite in both the front and the base of the sample. And it uh, had uh, quite a lot of gold, 27 gold, 27 grams gold. So. There is gold at Busan. Unfortunately, the uh, um, Brex thought there was a lot more than there, there actually is. But uh, you can see why we regard it as quite a, you know, very promising prospect. And uh, just a few more geology shots, which are probably quite new too. Um, this shows a, a base metal plus or minus arsenic pyrite, um, plus or minus carbonate in there in quite argillic alteration. Um, that ran, I can't remember the, the grade of that it was a while ago, but uh, very similar once again to clean, as was the presence of hydrothermal bretzias. <clears throat> and um, yeah, as I said, we we're always looking for any evidence that we could say that this was like uh, Killian. Um, so to uh, go back once again to our uh, soil anomaly and Busan Creek, which Brick's called the central zone, uh, a close up of that shows the anomaly is about a, a kilometre in the north east southwest direction which um, parallels the uh, the trend of the uh, magmatic arc in this place which was not unexpected I guess and so we next stage was to put trenches in some of the more um, anomalous parts of the, uh, the anomaly so as you can see when the results came in that uh, the intersections actually some of them were quite spectacular uh, six meters at 15 grams, 12 at 12. Uh, they were, as you can see, uh, you can imagine when they came in, we were very excited thinking that we've discovered a little mini Killian and uh, there was, you know, a kilometer strike length of this that was anomalous. Uh, we could see its surfaces, the mineralization was very attractive. So I guess we laid the groundwork for making Brex's scan believable because we proved that. Uh, 
at least on surface, that there was some very good mineralization. Unfortunately, as, as happens when you make an announcement in the A6, um, other people suddenly come out of the woodwork and there was a, uh, a neighboring company that uh, claimed that they had, uh, that our, our anomaly uh, was actually within their tenement, not theirs. So um, we had hoped to start drilling soon. So I guess we realized we had to solve that uh, that issue that it was the case. It was said it was actually hard to get accurate maps at that stage uh, due to security reasons. Something I know is unthinkable these days of Google Maps, but um, we had to solve it. So there was a new American survey company that had just come to Jakarta and we approached them and and they said that uh, they could offer, um, they could solve the issue for us because they've got a new surveying technique. They used them um, satellites, and uh, we all went ooh, and uh, called Global Positioning Systems, and uh, we were quite excited and impressed. And uh, I think John did a deal with them, and so um, they agreed to come out. And I left first, and I went to site. And the next week, uh, they all turned up in quite a parade with people carrying this large waterproof uh, box. And uh, a lot of ceremony evolved and the, they took it to an office. And they unloaded all their equipment, quite a, quite a large amount of equipment. They had to get one of our workers to climb a tree and cut the top off and put an antenna on top and a cable would come down. And then they set it up and, and they explained to us how, as we watched them, um, watching their little screen, that they were trying to connect with satellites and it was all very exciting when we saw that uh, they'd got a satellite and they told us they need several satellites and we watched and it seemed to take forever. And in fact, it did take a long time. It took all night. Um, and, but, and finally, the next morning, after many hours, that, uh, that they told us that they had actually got a single coordinate point. Uh, and we were very happy because uh, it confirmed that our central zone, well, well what they called, Beric called central zone, was actually within our tenement. So... Um, we thought, great, we can go ahead with our drilling because um, they'd done their job. So we're very happy. And then the bill came and it was $30,000 just to get one GPS point down. And when you think of how everybody has these on their phone now and watches, whatever, um, it's stories like that that make me feel quite old. And I, I know when I do tell it to students, they look at me and they realize, yes, you are that old. So... Um, things were looking good, and just as uh, the program we were progressing with um, um, planning for a drilling uh, drilling program, we also had to look at some other prospects that uh, Australian had. Um, the spoiler came, as I call him. He was one of our ex employees, Doug Pickard, and while we were away from the camp, he sort of came in, snuck in, and he started a local mining cooperative with people in, in the village. And he started uh, hydraulic mining in areas covered by our best soil and trench results. Very simple. Got map, got our maps, and he just saw where the best gold was, and he just started uh, alluvial mining there. So when by the time I got back to Busang, I realised that uh, there was a lot of illegal mining operations, and they were in full swing. And you can see there's a, a pointing to a trench that uh, had really good results, and uh, the other one shows uh, an area of a very high soil anomaly. So they were making quite a mess but i guess one positive that uh, we did get some uh, really good extensive bedrock exposure so we could see even more good geology this is one of the uh, historic photos from the time because it's actually the only official gold mine in busang's history uh including there's a uh, little permit there from uh, the local government who uh, gave the go-ahead to for this operation <laughs> So um, we eventually kicked um, kicked him out. We got the police and army, whatever, because he was working illegally. And he was removed and le leaving a trail of debt in the local village. Uh, what well, I guess I, when I looked at this, I, 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 saw, I thought about it and smirked that it, it actually showed that uh, Busang was tainted by scams even before Briggs was involved. So it wasn't such a clean project, I guess, when they picked it up. Uh, so we went ahead with our planning for the first drill program. And as you can imagine, our expectations were quite high because of those fantastic results we got from the trenching and the rock chips, etc. And uh, we were hoping that uh, drilling would show that we did find a little mini Killian. So by April of 89, uh, we contracted a drilling rig from Jakarta. Uh, and the driller was from Adelaide as well. So yet another Adelaide connection. And uh, drilling commenced in April and finished about five weeks afterwards. 
uh, with 19 holes completed for a total of just under 1,500 metres. So it was a successful program technically, uh, even in environments such as the jungles of Dika Stagus, Borneo. Um, and just an idea of what uh, geology was right uh, on there. Sorry, this is some of the geology I'm talking about. Um, we've got some um, some beautiful, you can imagine when you're, when you're looking at the cores coming out, uh, this was the very first drill hole, some of the core coming out, and you could see this beautiful base metal mineralization and intense alteration within a brezia. It's exactly what you want to see. And a bit further down the hole, there's more uh, alteration and once again, more base metal mineralization. And you could see carbonate veins and uh, uh, intense sericide alteration. So we, John and I had been to Kalian mine. We were invited to go there by Rio Tinto and we looked at their core and uh, it was fantastic. So, uh, and we're seeing this, we think, well, this we could see many similarities i guess we were disappointed there was nowhere near as uh wide the intersections as clean got but we thought well it's a start uh and that was the first hole so very excited but uh unfortunately um it ended up being the best hole of the whole program so everything was downhill after that the results were good you know very good gold you can imagine if that was the very first hole you drilled in, in a uh, in a new prospect you'd be very excited by that but uh as i said they were the best results we got and just an example of what uh, drilling was like, uh, this is once again historic uh, photo showing uh, the way drill core should be prepared. Uh, it's actually cut on site with half the core going off to the lab and half the core being put in core boxes and stored in the core shed. Uh, this is the way exploration should be done, not the way Briex did it later, as I will explain. So the results came in from the first phase of uh, the drilling. Um, as with many first pass drill programs, assay results were mixed. Some were surprising, some disappointing. Uh, of the 19 holes completed, 16 return assays with a leach the interval of a meter over a gram. So, but I guess in summary, what I could say is that uh, we were hoping after seeing the trench results of getting wider and higher grade intersections that we actually did get, which told us that um, that the area uh, had undergone super gene enrichment and so gold was preferentially uh, concentrated closer to the surface and this is significant we did announce this and we certainly told everyone that this was a problem there and it's the exact opposite of what Brex were reporting years later that uh, people seem to have forgotten what we had uh, said at the time so the wash up is we didn't find the next Kaleem, uh, but uh, and we were told that no more work was to be done on the site because um, Perth had hoped that there was enough sex appeal with everything we, that we'd found to try to attract uh, uh, other companies in. And at that time, the boom had sort of tailed off. So there were no more juniors really working in Indonesia. So we approached major some of the major mining companies and at least three came out to uh, to visit the prospect on site. And uh, unfortunately, all three basically uh, reported back to their head office that uh, it didn't really uh, meet their sort of size criteria or what they thought was prospective. And uh, interestingly to note that uh, you can imagine those geologists five years later were feeling a bit uncomfortable, squirming in their seats when the uh, intersections from Briex were announced. And I talked to Rio Tinto and uh, they said, uh, fortunately, their geologist was adamant, uh, Roger Norris was adamant that he was right and that uh, he couldn't understand why Briex were and managing to get the, um, but he, he stood first. He said, no, no, I, I, I'm happy with my original assessment. So good on him. Um, so that's basically sums up the uh, first part of the talk. And um, uh, I'm calling this intermission because it's it's the end of the first part before we get to the break start. So you can go off and make a coffee or so, or maybe not. I'm not going to play any music. Um, but it's also an intermission for, um, for, for my involvement with Busang because, uh, as you imagine, we had, our, our part in uh, exploration finished uh, at that stage. And I then went off and did um, some work in uh, Indonesia and other places. I worked in Irian, the island of New Guinea in Irian Jaya, the most stunning country I've ever worked in. Uh, made a little bit uncomfortable by when I had an experience with an um, Australian pilot who I found out too late had uh, on one trip back home uh, 
back to base camp was flying while he was hung over and he was playing chicken as he flew uh, flew his helicopter towards some of these limestone cliffs behind me. And uh, I told him when we landed that I was really upset with his behaviour and, and he actually couldn't remember what he did. So, so I then went and worked at a gold mine in South Australia where I was a partner and um, I'd been standing up on that ledge uh, 10 minutes before this rock fall happened. So I missed out on that little near-death experience. And then I moved to uh, Mount Isa where I, uh, coming back to base camp one day after a break, uh, we hit a kangaroo as we were about to land. And yes, uh, the front wheel uh, went down and we scraped along the highway. And once again, I got out of that without any scratches. Then I went to Africa and where you can guess, yes, another near-death experience. Uh, this one was more serious. You could see there was a lot of damage to the car and a lot of damage to my body. And um, I took me six months or so to recover uh, back home in Adelaide. And it was during this, towards the end of that recovery, that I got a call from my old friends at MRA in Indonesia saying that they needed me back in Jakarta urgently because, uh, because there was a boom on. And they told me that uh, someone had picked up Busang and uh, had reported uh, amazing results and it was causing a boom. And I just laughed and thought, you know, how could they possibly be doing that? There was nothing there. But um, I'd been there for a while uh, recovering and they said, oh, look, we'll just put you in office. It doesn't matter. You're on crutches. And uh, I was very happy to go because I was ready for uh, something new at that stage. So Brex is involved. And um, I guess I'll show you some of the um, people involved in the company. Uh, so you know what the names, you can put faces to names. This was photo was actually taken on site. It's quite a well widely distributed photo on the net. Uh, of the people from the company. From left to right, there's uh, Jerry Allo. Uh, I love the title Project Metallurgist. Uh, I, I've never understood why when you're going through early stage exploration, you would need a Project Metallurgist on site. Um, and then next to him is John Felderhoff, who was sort of a larger than life character, very loud, very boisterous. He's the guy that brought the project uh, to Brex's attention and uh, he was yeah an interesting character. Uh, Michael de Guzman next to him he was the Filipino geologist who um, became the exploration manager and uh, next to him is a guy called Cesar Puspa. So there are three Filipino um, employees that they all worked they all lived and worked at the Busang site and the majority of uh, a lot of the geologists there who worked there were also Philippine or mates of mates I guess. And uh, a lot of them were young Australian University. Uh, so there was certainly a very strong presence of that there. The only person missing this photo is uh, a guy called David Walsh, Walsh, who was the president and the CEO of Briex, uh, based in Canada. And uh, Felderhoff was the guy that had um, convinced him to buy into Briex based on the geology that he'd seen at surface, which was uh, all the work we had done. So. Okay, I didn't say I'd give a forensic analysis of uh, Brex, but I will present the timeline of how things went. Uh, it's far more complex than I'm going to show, uh, which is still, you know, quite involved anyway, but it's more complex than that, and I won't. I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. So uh, the Brex, the company, was formed in 89 in Canada, and Felderhoff convinced uh, David Wash to buy uh, the prospect, Busang, uh, from Montague, and he started drilling. Uh, the first two drill holes actually came up with nothing, which wouldn't surprise me or anybody really. Um, and he threatened to, um, he told the Joes apparently, so I've read, that uh, he was gonna shut down the program. And um, this was unfortunate because some of the other people involved were down on their luck and they really could have done with the job. So miraculously, the third drill hole hit significant gold. It saved the project, so they kept going. Uh, very fortunate for those uh, people who were down on their luck. Uh, and it didn't just hit some gold, it actually hit significant gold. So over the next year, drilling continued and news began to spread of a significant find. And there were, Felderhoff claimed a, a 2 million ounce resource. And then Briex acquired the tenements immediately east of Busang called Busang 2, which I think I've shown you on the map is where I went and did some, uh, some other reconnaissance here. At the time, it was when I was there, it was owned by an Australian company, but uh, I, can't, I don't know if they dropped it or if they actually sold it to, um, to Briex. But um, they acquired that. 
of course, much more complex than I've just written there. But uh, if you're interested in find out that story, I'm sure you can find that somewhere. By next year, towards the end of 95, BREX announced that Busan could contain more than 30 million ounces of gold, and most of that in the southeast zone, which, if you remember, that's where I found very little at surface. Uh, so this puts it in the class of a, of a, of a world-class gold deposit. So, yeah. And it was soon after that that I got my call while I was on crutches from um, MRA in Jakarta saying that they really needed me in Indonesia, regardless of if I was in crutches or whatever. They just said, please come. They'd stick me in an office somewhere. <clears throat> I was quite excited because I was needing a change. And uh, soon after I arrived, I was uh, looking uh, forward to... Um, catching up with some of my old colleagues and friends. And in Jakarta at the time, uh, there was a gathering which is called St. Barbara's Drinks. Yes, uh, Steve and Barbara, I see, have just put down that it was in the Smuggler's Arms in Chilanda. Very correct. Uh, St. Barbara, as we know, is the patron saint of miners and also the patron saint of the monthly beer drinking and exploration gossip session. There was a lot of gossip went on. And I was quite looking forward to this. Uh, and um, I went there hoping to catch up with friends and sort of get into some nice chats. And I, the reception I got was actually not what I expected because instead of sort of slaps on the backs and you know, offers a free beer, um, I got finger pointing and laughing and ridicule. when people realized who I was and they said, oh, you're one of those ones who lived on Busan and you missed, you missed it. You missed such a world-class deposit. And I got laughed at and uh, I got quite, yeah, quite pissed off basically, quite annoyed. And um, I could see there because John, my, my mate John Levin, who I'd worked with before, he'd re he, he was still in Jakarta. So he must have been going through this for a lot longer than I had, and um, but he put up with it, or credit to him. But uh, I was, yeah, very disappointed that this was this was happening. I I spent my time telling them that, uh, so no, 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 no. There's I didn't miss anything. There's nothing there. There's nothing there, and uh, and they just you know laughed even harder and saying you're only saying that because you missed it. You're embarrassed that you missed it. So um, okay, that was that was my life in uh, Jakarta back in Jakarta. Um, so uh, soon after I arrived, Briex listed on the TSX with price rising to 192 Canadian dollars. And the ridicule didn't finish, it only got worse. So I thought, guys, I know I'm on crutches. I know you want me in an office, but please get me out of here. Um, please put me in a jungle camp somewhere. So that's what they did. I managed to move to Sumatra and as far away from Jakarta and St. Barbara as possible. But what it did do was was it gave me an opportunity to have a think about what I knew of Busang uh, and sort of merge it with what I had heard was happening, uh, what I had seen in terms of information they'd published. And um, it was interesting. Um, so where this was the uh, uh, sort of a map I made of, of the intrusive with um, some of the um, alteration they claimed to have found. And I've overlain my sampling that I did, the rock sampling that I showed you. Uh, that's our soil anomaly up the, in our area there. <clears throat> and um, all the little black dots show where Briex had were, were doing drilling or had been doing drilling. And I was surprised to see they were doing so much drilling in the southeast zone because I thought there was actually very little prospectivity there. Um, they claim in, the, in what was our central zone, that's where they actually started drilling, ho however. And they claimed to have drilled 91 holes where we had done our 19. And in close up, you could see that they drilled absolutely everywhere where we had already been. We found good intersections and trenches, but our drill holes, as I have shown you, had interestingly but thin mineralization. Well, they drilled everywhere around those and somehow managed to find um, 2 million ounces of gold. So good luck to them. Uh, I pointed this out to um, to people. Uh, it's amazing how no one really wanted to know. This was a cross section that uh, was presented by Briex in Jakarta at the time, uh, and I was quite interested to see that because it had a drill hole which I had um, I had sat on the rig and I'd logged the core, uh, and I remember it quite well. And uh, it had some nice alteration, but mineralization was uh, wait was thin was weak, you know, four grams, everything was under a gram. And uh, 
what they didn't show in their cross section was uh, uh, the presence of one of our trenches, which did have interesting gold. But this is an example of that we saw that uh, we could not replicate what was at surface, and we assumed that there was a bit of super gene alteration. This is not a great example of it. They were better, but this is one type of use because it turned up on their cross section. So Brex drilled right near where we were and they managed to um, find a lot better than what we did you know 26 meters at 13 grams and 22 meters at three are uh, exactly where we were and uh, also further down the intersections got very thick and very high grade 69 meters at seven grams is fantastic and the hole there 69.4 meters that is hole three which is the hole that I think Brex drilled when they were told if that didn't get any gold, they will pull out. Uh, and as I said, they didn't just get some gold, they got a lot of gold. So very fortunate. I pointed this out to people, nobody wanted to listen, but it wasn't just me. There was a um, Newmont geologist there who was actually at this presentation and she asks a question of why is it that they managed to get such amazing values when the drill hole that we did um, was a lot, lot less than that. And she was told that um, by the Brex, I can't remember if it was de Guzman or Felderhoff, uh, one of the uh, Brex personnel said that, uh, oh, that's because uh, they drilled, they assayed only half core. And they said, for this type of memorization, you've got to assay whole core. As well as half core, they said they used a wet drilling method which washed away any gold that was available in the core anyway, which uh, to this geologist, to her credit, sound, uh, sounded ridiculous. And so she was going to, to to rebut that. And before she could say anything, she was shut down, of course, by the Brex geologist. So she never got to ask her questions. But, I mean, this was in the public domain. This was not a secret. This is what Brex reporting. And no one seemed to take notice, or apart from the odd exception, uh, or people believed uh, what uh, Briggs was saying, that it was that we were using an incorrect method of assaying and drilling, and therefore uh, we missed it. So this was the environment that uh, that we uh, that uh, was exposed to. So, and this is another interesting, I had this map here. This was a map that uh, Briggs produced early on, 94. Um, it's actually, when I have a look at it, is pretty much a copy of a map that we produced at the time. Uh, and just for an example, these are all my drill, all my rock chip samples. I told you I wouldn't have a look at uh, my my initials to prefix them. Joe, they all had very little gold, almost no gold, you know, le below detection limit, very little, very little gold at surface. Uh, and these blue lines, uh, bricks, claim a mapped traceable trends of mineralization, yeah, but except there's no mineralization. Um, and they also on laid overlaid onto that map. A sampling that they had recently done, which also in the southeast zone, as you can remember, as I said, this is where Briex claimed to have the bulk of the world's greatest gold deposit. Um, and all interestingly, all these samples are pre prefixed by BS, so I'm not quite sure what that's for, but uh, um, it was perhaps important of things to come. You could say that uh, there was a lot of BS coming out of uh, Briex announcements at the time, so. Uh, as I said, I uh, soon after the uh, I arrived and I escaped to the jungle. And while I was in the jungle, uh, Briex hit peak market capitalization at six billion dollars. Just take that, you know, remember that that six billion dollars built on a lie. Um, uh, a few months later, the estimates now at fifty-seven million ounces, and that very highly reputable uh, American financial services company Lehman Brothers strongly recommended a buy the gold discovery of the century. And by this stage, uh, the project was getting so big, the government sort of couldn't just stand idle. So uh, everyone wanted a piece of the Busang pie. Uh, even the president's children fought each other to be the 10%, uh, the which is required by law for all sort of projects like that, owned by foreigners. Uh, and Sahado said that um, he, if, thank you very much, Briex, for finding the world's greatest gold discovery, but you're just a you know, junior. We need to get a major in there to develop this properly. So you can imagine every major mining company sort of got up and thought, we should try to get involved. Uh, they all jockeyed for position. Uh, and Barrick enlisted former President uh, George Bush to lobby Sahato. And I was watching this in the jungle going, you know, thinking, shaking my head, going, how can this be? 
Uh, Rio Tinto, I've got to put a shout out to Theo Van Leeuwen and his team. Um, they had removed themselves from the bidding war because Brix had approached them. Brix actually approached them because they wanted Rio Tinto to be a, a preferred partner and they're offering a deal. Uh, Brix said, look, sure, we will we will get involved, but you've got to let us drill a due diligence hole first. And Brix told them that, no, that's not part of the deal. So Rio said, if, if you do not let us drill a due diligence hole, we are not interested. So credits to them. So Freeport ended up winning out because uh, the owner, Jim Bob Moffat, or well, the chairman, was one of Suharto's closest friends, like stepping back from the 1960s, where Freeport, if I'm not mistaken, signed the first international contract after the um, the fall of the Sukarno government in Suharto was installed after a coup. So um, they, uh, it was quite a significant uh, contract to sign. So I think they became, they remained friends over the years, and Freeport became involved. And there was me sitting in my little jungle camp in West Kalimantan on the other side of Borneo. And Freeport announced the program of due diligence drilling. And I sat there thinking, here we go, finally. So back to our timeline. It's amazing that after uh, in early 97, a suspicious fire at the Busan camp destroys the geology office in the core shed. And the site was bulldozed before an investigation team arrived conveniently. Uh, and this, to me, sort of shows the beginning of the end, uh, and I think this is where the cleanup started. So someone realised that uh, the, the end was near and it was time to, uh, to start getting preparing for that. So we knew at this stage that uh, in, after that, uh, the agreement between the Indonesian government and uh, Freeport and, uh, and BRICS was signed, which gave uh, Indonesian interests with the government and others. 40%. Uh, Brix went from 80% of the prospect down to 45%. Freeport got 15 You can imagine that Brix shareholders are probably very annoyed because they <clears throat> they um, they suddenly uh, lost, went from 80% of the project to 45 And uh, in a way, they thought, oh, I guess they would have thought that their value had decreased, even though they were getting help from a major to mine the damn thing. But... Uh, Fortunately, the very next day, uh, Brix announced the resource had uh, gone to 71 million analysis. So instead of having 80% of 57 million, they got 40% of 71. And then two days later, to make it even sweeter for Brix shareholders, uh, Fred Felderhoff said he was comfortable with a 200 million ounce resource. And he said, here's the segue to my earlier uh, slide, but there was lots of blue sky. And we're not talking about the Bali Papan Hotel, so... John Felderhoff's words. Mar early March, Freeport began their due diligence drilling at Busan. And less than three weeks later, the report was that de Guzman, the Filipino exploration manager, and the pilot left Balikpapan in a helicopter to meet the Freeport team at Busan, but only the pilot arrived. Uh, he said that he turned around because he heard it, he, he felt a gush of wind and he saw that the back seat was empty. So He's, he told police that uh, de Guzman had jumped out. Police um, deemed it a suicide, of course. That was the official timeline, but uh, I've actually recently found, uh, talked to some people who, uh, who can colour in some of the areas. Um, the rumour mill. So suddenly, although it used to be a chore going to St. Barbara night, pub nights, uh, suddenly it was fun again because uh, the gossip was going around you know, non-stop. Apparently, de Guzman had uh, committed suicide and left a, a, a note saying that he did this because he had contacted hepatitis, even though it turns out the hepatitis was treatable. The helicopter pilot, I, I was told this by a, a crew who used to fly in that, was a new guy, ex-military. This was his first flight for Brinix, so uh, convenient. Uh, the, the helicopter, I, I talked to the survey team who was going to go with de Guzman on this very flight. The plan was for de Guzman to go with a survey team from Balikpapan to the site. And at the airport, just before he was going to get in the helicopter, de Guzman bumped them off and said, no, you've got to go on a later flight. I need to do this alone. I mean, that's not suspicious, is it? Uh, the body was recovered in the jungle three or four days after he allegedly jumped out. I laughed at that because when I was there in the 1980s, there was a commercial flight that 
nearby that disappeared and had military family on board. So the Air Force was out looking and uh, the plane could not be found for days. In this case, one body jumps out in the jungle and it's found within a few days. This is prior to GPS tracking on helicopters. Very, very unlikely, but that's my opinion. The body in the autopsy uh, was heavily disfigured and did not have a penis in the explanation given due to wild animals, whereas the conspiracy theorists think that uh, he was a Filipino geologist, uh, Catholic, and therefore not circumcised, whereas the body, as a journalist uh, suggested, uh, came from the local Balik Papan Morgue, was probably uh, a local Muslim and uh, and um, circumcised. So how do you get rid of evidence? You blame it on uh, pigs, because apparently pigs have a propensity to um, to eat penises. So, and of course, one of the most amazing ones is that um, some of it, uh, it turns out that uh, Felderhoff was not the good little Filipino Catholic that uh, everyone thought, that uh, suddenly a lot of ex-wives came out of the woodwork. And uh, there are reports that he had at least four, four ex-wives. And some of these wives are... Uh, continued to get payment uh, long after he had died from unknown sources. And I've actually talked to the family of one of the wives and uh, he says that he confirmed that, yeah, that uh, certainly money came in a couple of times from, they tried to trace it and could not, and uh, unknown sources. So, you know, I would be very suspicious. This is actually a photo off the net where, which claims that this is the moment where Felderhoff was about to go in the helicopter to, uh, Boo saying, not sure, I can't confirm that is or not, but um, it's an interesting historical record. So, the due, due diligence drilling from Freeport, where did they decide to do it? Well, that's the um, southeast zone, which reportedly had the bulk of the um, 70 million ounces or 200 million ounces or whatever it was. Uh, there were two particular drill holes they choose, chose, which uh, had some fantastic intersections, 166 metres at over four grams gold, which... Uh, as, as an exploration geologist, you dream of, of, of drill holes like that. So Freeport decided to twin that, twin those two holes. Now, what I've learnt since then is that uh, March the 1st, Freeport begins its due diligence drilling on the deposit. I spoke with a geologist who worked was on the rig, and it was his duty to... Uh, make sure the drilling went well, make sure the core was secure as it came out of the um, uh, drill rig, make sure the core was taken safely to by helicopter to the airport. He accompanied the core on plane to Jakarta and he, came, he accompanied it all the way to the um, assay lab. And um, <clears throat> that was his job. And uh, he said that everything, well, he was surprised when the core came, was coming out that he thought, it didn't look very mineralized and it did not look very altered, but it was twinning a hole that went 160 meters at four grams. But he couldn't understand, but he thought, well, we'll see. Uh, this geologist then had already, dis had already, oh, I, unfortunately, I can't tell you his name because I haven't actually asked permission if I can use his name at this stage. Um, he had uh, already planned to go to Canada after the hole was drilled because. Um, PDAC, were, there, there was the um, PDAC uh, convention on in, in Toronto. And so he flew there soon after the hole was put into the lab. And this was interesting because at this PDAC uh, gathering, there was a, an award being given for Explorer of the Year, uh, which was won by Felderhoff. And uh, while he was there, uh, interesting that while, while this geologist was, Freeport geologist was at the compete at conference uh, he said uh, he got a call from his secretary in jakarta he said the preliminary assays have just come through from that twin hole and she said she actually apologized saying i'm very sorry pat but uh, there's no gold there's no gold in this so uh interestingly enough three hours later this geologist watched as felderhoff got up on stage and received his explorer of the year award you can't write this stuff. This doesn't come in the in the Michael Michael McConaughey film, but it's a, such an amazing story. Can you imagine? And I, I guess when I when I was told this, I was trying to think in mind what what would sort of scenario that you're at the world's largest gathering of exploration mining personnel, twenty I can't remember twenty thousand or so, 
and you've just been given the information that can destroy a six billion dollar company what would you do the temptation would be there for you to you know i'm sure you've got some mates there people you know and you would just be very tempted to sort of tap on their shoulders and say guess what there's nothing in it um what would you do if your best friend was there and you found out that he put his um, life savings superannuation retirement fund in the BRIC shares and um would you tell him to sell hell yeah but uh this guy jolly just told me that he got a call straight away from um from freeport jakarta dave potter i think uh, to say that uh, you must return to jakarta immediately and under no circumstances can you talk to anybody so he never did tell the story he never actually did mention to anyone what uh, he would just heard and he uh went back to jakarta so and that's you know a few days after that is when de guzman apparently committed suicide so these two due diligence drill holes as we say, the uh, the amazing grades that was uh, got uh, uh, made announced by um, Brix when Freeport announced their uh, reassay of uh, the twin holes, they got zilch. Uh, and naturally, uh, as I said, because I had done sampling in there, that sort of looks like the grades that um, that I had gotten at surface. Brix uh, had prior to prior to this when uh, when they were quizzed about this southeast zone uh, by people who've been on site brick said oh there's no gold at surface because there were, the gold was heavily leached and it was enriched at depth uh and which was as i said earlier was quite um, quite amusing because we had found the exact opposite where gold had actually been enriched at surface and which is why we could never re replicate our trench results well apparently the opposite was happening down the southeast zone <clears throat> getting near the end guys so freeport could not um they didn't just sit on those results they thought well we could actually be accused or we, we the questions could be asked about uh the process that was done in the uh, jakarta laboratory so um because things are always better in the us let's have it uh let's have the uh, samples treated in, in, a, in our own laboratory i think that could be in um i can't i don't know somewhere in the in the, in the southeast there uh and uh someone could um correct me for that uh so this is jolly just told me that once again he was in charge of the samples and they were taken from the rig to a helicopter to a plane and directly flown to um to the freeport lab in the united states and uh, then he then he tells me that soon after that the uh the men in black as he describes it squad arrived at uh, the freeport office in jakarta where one day when he was there that suddenly these people in suits turned up you can imagine I, I'm, I'm guessing that they probably had sunglasses and black hats and they look like CIA or something I'm sure it's nothing like that but uh, that's 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 the sort of image I'm getting and uh, they went around the office and anything that had anything to do with Briex Busang was throw was taken away from the uh, whoever it was that worked there and put in uh, a large plastic bag so rock samples any photos uh this geologist i was, had talked to said that he had photos and samples that were put in the plastic bag any um storage disk drives any laptops everything was taken away and put in bags and taken out of the office tied up and taken out of the office uh and uh, never to be seen again so i have no idea what happened to those whether they were burnt or were there in some warehouse somewhere in um, um in america we will may never know and uh, then finally, Freeport announced the due, they, they finally announced the due diligence of core return insignificant amounts of gold. Uh, understandably, that day the shares of Briex crash. Uh, soon after, a I think Canadian Strathcona uh, were retained to audit both Briex and Freeport because, amazingly, Briex came up uh, had said that they thought that uh, maybe Freeport were. An, uh, reporting low grades to try to uh, push down the price of Briex to make the acquisition uh, easier and cheaper, incredibly enough. Um, so, um, like I said, so Barbara's was suddenly a lot more fun. Uh, I had been vindicated and um, I was looking forward to going to the next meeting. I'd been working in um, West Kalimantan at this stage and uh, it was time to go and break and I thought, so Barbara's is on in a few days. Fantastic. Uh, and I was flying from West Kalimantan to Jakarta on April the 1st, which appropriately was April Fool's Day. 
and I sat down next to a, a, a lady and, and I noticed soon after that she had a little uh, shirt that had uh, CNN written on it. And I thought, oh, interesting. And I asked her what she was doing in Kalamante. And I, I sort of guessed because there was a, a, um, a tribal, uh, you could call it a tribal war that was going on, a, cu a cultural conflict. And she sort of confirmed that, yes, she'd been covering that. And I, uh, she told me what they'd found. And it was, yeah, pretty interesting. And I asked if I could get a copy of the, the, the video. Remember those? videos no, no exchanging of um of thumb drives with digital um files on them uh, she said that she would send me a copy of the video and then she asked what i did and i said i was a geologist and her eyes widened and uh, she asked have you if i'd ever heard of this prospect called uh, busang so of course my eyes uh, i sat back and said how much time do you have and i told her my story and um she actually was really excited and said can I please put you in front of a camera? I would love to interview you for CNN. Put it on, um, put it on the Southeast Asian News. Uh, tempting as that was, because I would have loved to have actually finally told my story and 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 feel very vindicated after being ridiculed. I said, look, unfortunately, my directors, the other people of MRA, had asked that I, under no circumstances, um, give any interviews because uh, they just did not want to be associated with. Although we were not involved as I said, guilt by association. So I said no, but uh, the mischievous side of me said, well, perhaps what I could offer you is that uh, there's a St. Barbara's, there's a gathering of miners on Friday where there'll be a lot of people in the industry who are there. And this will be the first gathering since the news of, uh, of the scam broke. And I said, that could be a good opportunity for you to, um, to come and uh, meet some geologists and speak to them. And she said, do you think it'll be okay if we turn up there with cameras? Won't people be upset? And I looked at her and basically thinking, I don't care if anyone's upset because these are the people that spent a lot of time ridiculing me. So this is my payback time. So I told her to come about nine o'clock because by that stage, a lot of the, a lot of the players there were had already had a, a skinful. They were quite uh, quite happy with all the beer they'd been drinking. So, and I also pointed out, if, I gave us some names of people they should interview because I know these people do like to talk, especially if they had some beer. And uh, then we, I went to my office, and sure enough, a few days later, during St. Barbara's, she turned up with a CNN cameraman and uh, started interviewing some of the people I'd nominated. Uh, I'd also had a bit of beer at that stage, so I made sure I kept away from her so I wouldn't say anything silly. That uh, footage, um, I've I've only seen part of it, but it did make CNN news. So, uh, I, if anyone has got a copy of it, anyone, I'd love to see it. But uh, that was my retribution after all my experiences the year before. Well, we sort of kept in touch uh, with this um, with this reporter, but uh, then uh, we sort of just lost touch. And um, the next I saw of her was uh, she actually was on a cover of a Time magazine. This is Maria Ressa. She won the Person of the Year, Time magazine Person of the Year for her work as a journalist and uh, freedom of journalism. And only a few years ago, she actually won a Nobel Peace Prize for her efforts to safeguard freedom, as, as it says. And I, I, I saw that and I thought, wow, my opportunity all those years ago when she asked me to be interviewed uh, on camera, um, I could have, you know, you could have Googled my name and uh, what would have popped up was an interview with a Nobel Prize laureate. And uh, unfortunately, um, I had did the right thing by uh, MRA and uh, knocked back the chance to uh, to be immortalized. <laughs> so um, that's my uh, little bit of uh, experience or my, my uh, with, with a Nobel Prize laureate. So going back to Rex. <clears throat> Strathcona was doing their due diligence and they confirmed that there was no gold at Busang and they claimed the samples had been tampered with, which I think was pretty obvious at that stage. And a few months after that, Brex files for bankruptcy and no one is surprised by that. And of course, the big question is, how was it done? And basically the answer is we may never know. Uh, Strathcona themselves said that it was incredible that uh, they met this scam was managed to be perpetrated for so long, uh, which is the case. The most widely accepted theory from published information uh, and from St. Barbara's gossip is that uh, one of the geologists on site at first probably was shaving some of his wedding ring or jewellery just to try to prove there's gold there to, to keep the project going. Because as I said, they were going to shut the project down. 
and then it got a momentum and it was a case i guess is like how do we stop this uh and the whole scam was undetectable because the process was really tightly controlled from the drill rig to where the core was stored on site it was in a lock core shed and it was transported to brex's own sample lab at samarinda not on site and it's here that most of the salting likely took place so who was involved yeah, we can never know. A lot of people point uh, point at Michael de Guzman because he was the exploration manager, but um, I have my doubts. He was uh, in charge of many other projects and he worked, he had to travel around Indonesia, not just at Busing. So whether it was a group or not, we may never know. They all seem to be no longer in the picture. What was the end game? I mean, I guess that's the question I ask myself is like, okay, you start this scam, how can you possibly why would you keep it going for three years when you know that you will be exposed at some stage? And to me, it's possibly a case of it started off as a good idea at the time. And then it was, oh, my God, how do we get out of this? Uh, and it was a case of just waiting for the right moment, which is possibly when Freeport got involved. And it, then people realize we really got to get out of this. Was de, de Guzman the, the main protagonist or was he just uh, a bystander? Not a bystander, but he was just part of the group. Did he agree to maybe take the blame? Um, if, if, if he does, if people are convinced of his suicide, he would be blamed. And once he's blamed, no one will look at anyone else. Who knows? It's, uh, it's a great story, one that the movie never really addressed, and uh, maybe it will be in, the t in, in, in some stage. So, yes, was he the fall guy? A very poor pun. I do apologise. I This photo is actually Michael de Guzman. This was sent to me yesterday, and I had to put it on this talk because I was thinking he looks like he's um, practising for jumping out of a helicopter and landing on the ground or so. But, uh, uh Yes, it's a it's a great story, and we may never know exactly what happened. But uh, one of the other questions is how was this able to be perpetrated for three years without people being suspicious? I guess there were some suspicious, but not enough. And uh, as I said, I John Levings and I we tried to point out to people over the years uh, where we thought that uh, there was problems, but no one needed to know. No one wanted to know. No one wanted to um, to listen to us. It was uh, we were just uh, you know just young geologists. Well, I was, uh, or maybe just because we were only Australian geologists. Um, why was Briex's insistence of assaying whole core and not keeping at least half core accepted for so long? Um, Normit uh, did some metallurgical testing and and they actually noticed that there were rounded gold grains you know this is red flags and they approached Fuldoff and he came up with this ridiculous example uh, excuse to say that oxidizing agents in a soil create a situation similar to a riverbed um, quite strange they were not obliged to make their findings public so uh, why is a question we should ask and a lot of people that went to site um, would have seen that there was uh, there were comments that there was sample prep equipment on site which was quite new but it was never used and the comment was well the observation was that instead of actually treating samples on site it was all shipped off down river to Samarinda to a, a, a core shed which was on the edge of the town where no one went to uh, except Briex geologists uh, very quiet under no observation whereas if it was done on site everyone would have could have seen what was happening no one questioned. Uh, then, as I said earlier, the, the uh, geology office and part of the course shed destroyed by fire. All these things were sort of put together. When you look back in retrospect, you wonder how on earth people didn't sort of put the story together sooner. Um, I recently heard from yet another Adelaide connection to this story. Uh, the software company uh, MapTech in Jakarta, uh, they were asked... Uh, I think Freeport asked them to come to Jakarta to because they had uh, state-of-the-art software at that stage to do modelling of uh, all bodies. So they sent up a, uh, a geologist with a laptop and he went to the um, BREEX office and used all the BREEX data to model the all body. And they contacted the um, BREEX uh, chairman or MD, uh, Bob Johnson, uh, and told him, look, the data looks good. It hangs together. The all body looks great but had some reservations. So look, it's really weird that um, 
to Guzman, uh, the geologist who'd since three years managing the world's greatest gold discovery, never wanted to look at the model in 3D. This is at a time when 3D modeling was quite a rarity. And he always had an excuse. He always had a meeting, something he wanted to do, a phone call. She said it was weird. He never wanted to see, uh, I guess I call it the ultrasound principle, because it's imagine if you're a dad and you have a chance to see your very first sort of ultrasound of a baby, you want to see it. Uh, de Guzman did not. He did not want to see his the equivalent of an ultrasound of his of his ore body. Uh, and she told Bob, and Bob said that does sound very strange. So she, he actually rang the Freeport um, geologist. I'm not sure if it was Dave Potter or whoever in Jakarta and told him his uh, reservations. And the Freeport uh, guy apparently said, yeah, well, we'll just add that to the list of um, little interesting uh, vignettes we've got about what's happening in this deposit. So the winner of the Red Flag Award goes to the Volcanic Pool Theory. I love this one. These are quotes from um, Fortune magazine. Um, de, de Guzman explained why well, well, the rounded edges, he sort of a bit of volcanic pool theory. Uh, as you say, he proposed when a volcano collapses back onto itself, gold is created from massive buildup of heme of pressure. He argued volcanic pressure causes non-uniform distribution of gold across the core sample, therefore requiring the entire sample to be tested for accuracy. No half core. I don't see the difference between getting a larger core size and I'm saying half of it, but let's not go there. So the volcanic pool theory motivated Briggs' selection of Bruce saying and justified their unorthodox exploration practices as saying whole core and not half core. Once again, looking back in retrospect, you would think how could anyone possibly listen to something as ridiculous as a volcanic pool theory? It was accepted by many investors and actually a few geologists that I met too. Um, a bit of colour for the story. Uh, Richard Behar, who had written the article I just showed in the, in the previous slide, he interviewed Feldhoff after he'd been told he was Explorer of the Year. And he asked some questions like, you know, why did you, uh, how did you manage to find this deposit when the previous operator, uh, i.e. me and West Australian, uh, were unable to um, to do that? Uh, and he said uh, the whole, he gave all sorts of excuses, uh, excuses, the holes are too shallow, the workers used a wet drilling method etc 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 and then he comes and says well geology wasn't on their minds they were all spending all their time in town chasing girls and naming creeps after them um i read this and was as you can imagine quite upset because at the time uh when i was there yes we certainly named all the creeks because there were no names for the creeks in any maps uh, and uh as you go along, you think what her name is. My mother's got a name, a creek named after her. My two sisters have got creeks named after her. My very first girlfriend has got a name, a creek named after her. And the survey crew, all their wives and sisters, everyone's, we just, I just use female names. And this guy, unfortunately, had interpreted that as suggesting I was some um, Casanova at the time and spent all my time in non interested in geology. So thank you very much, Felderhoff. Legal consequences, getting towards the end, guys. Nobody ever convicted of the Briex scam. Felderhoff and Walsh moved to the Cayman and Bahamas, respectively, because they had no extradition treaties with uh, Canada. The courts ruled in their favour, claiming they acted with their normal professionalism, which by his very nature bestows credibility. Felderhoff has proven he took all reasonable care. Um, I mean, you must read this and, and smirk in retrospect. Where are they now? Briggs people, Walsh, Walsh proves that you can't take it with you. Um, he had sold a lot of shares previous to the um, stock being exposed, uh, the scam being exposed. And he died, he moved to the Bahamas as well, and he died of an aneurysm the very, that very year. Felderhoff went to the Caymans and he was acquitted of fraud. And he actually then moved to Bali, which I think was a very brave move because a lot of people in Indonesia who lost money who probably would have liked him killed. Uh, and then he moved uh, to the Philippines where I think he remarried and he uh, lived a simple but peaceful life. And he died only a few years ago. Uh, Michael de Guzman died in Borneo. Or did he? Um, most of the geologists seem to be living in obscurity. I've tried to track him down, can't find anything. John Irvine, who ran the Ballypopan Assay Lab, retired soon after the scam broke and moved home to Australia. 
I was very sad about that. He was a very, very good man. And he unfortunately got tainted with the brush of Boosang. What about the actual prospect? Uh, it was a good prospect when we left it, but it was ruined by uh, Boosang, by Brex. And I guess I ask 300 holes drew by Brex, none, none of them remain. There are no core photos. There's no nothing available information. What if they actually hit something? Can you imagine if they actually did hit a zone? I mean, we hit some really good intersections that were thin. But what if they hit something a bit more thicker? We will never know because that core no longer exists. Um, it's been destroyed. There's no photos of it. Uh, it. They could have actually hit something or even have vectored as something uh, perhaps larger. And in fact, uh, the exploration or the regional manager for Barrick at the time, a guy called uh, Steve Bug, a friend of mine, uh, he, he I had often talked to him about Boosang and he thought that uh, Boosang actually still had some, um, some, um, some legs in it, so he would like he, he he wanted to be involved uh, after the story broke, after the scam broke, and he went to the mines department and he said, um, "Look, can we uh, can we go in there and uh, do some of our own work?" And the, he was told, and as he said, no uncertain terms and in language that surprised him, that uh, under no circumstances would they would the mines department ever let a Western company back into Busan, and that's actually been the case. So in the last twenty five years. Busang has slowly slipped back into obscurity. Um, there's no one, as far as I know, no exploration company has ever gone back there. And Google Earth shows, uh, uh, you can do the Google Earth history um, feature, and it shows that since that time, uh, the site's just been reclaimed by the jungle. Uh, it's back to how it was 30 years ago. Uh, but it, while that's happening, palm oil plantations are creeping ever closer for the east, and they'll eventually reach that, I'm sure. Uh, and the question is, will anyone ever risk exploring the Busang Intrusive again? Because as I've said before, there are lots of good indications there. Um, perhaps we, uh, there's only ever been one 19-hole drill program to test it. There's a lot of area that uh, could be looked at again. Um, there were some local miners were still there, and they're still on the site uh, doing little bits of um, crushing and alluvial mining. So at least they're still getting some um, some gold out of it. Uh, so what happened? What what did uh, that's pretty much the end of the Brex stands, except um, Brex, the 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 lingering effect of Brex is that it destroyed exploration in Indonesia for years, uh, and not just Indonesia, but uh, worldwide. Um, it was hard to raise money. Uh, it was impossible to raise money in Indonesia for for gold. Uh, when I went back um, 2010 and started working there again. Uh, when I was looking, trying to find geologists and uh, I was reading CVs, interviewing people, there was a whole generation of geologists who the only experience they had was nickel, coal, nickel, coal, nickel, coal. No one had done gold exploration at that time. So that's changing, luckily. And uh, there's some absolutely excellent work going on at the moment. Um, a lot of very good Indonesian geologists, some, some good Indonesian companies doing some um, brilliant work. So finally it's got out of it, but uh, they dug a hole there for a while. So when I did go back to Indonesia eventually, um, I really enjoyed my time there, as I do every time I'm in Indonesia. And I'll leave you with a slide of me on my last project there, where um, this was the way I got to work uh, uh, from, from my home in Adelaide. Very pleasant. At the base of that rainbow that you see in the distance, there's a um, VMS deposit uh, with about 70 million tonnes, uh, 2 million ounces of gold and 72 million ounces of silver. Um, verifiable, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, and currently being developed. And uh, these are the sorts of views I got as I was going there on the way there. So that pretty much is um, the story of Busang as far as I can tell, uh, as, I, as I'll tell you in this talk. I There's a lot more I could talk about. There's a lot more questions to ask about how Brex was allowed to flourish and what happened to how things were done. But um, I, I'm pretty sure I've tried to uh, limit this talk. I don't think I've done a very good job of it, and I apologise for that, Jessica. But uh, that's pretty much me.